Welcome to our new study in the book of Revelation. Revelation speaks to our world today. Everyone knows our world is rapidly changing. Come and see how God already knew about it. You will discover it's easier to understand than you thought. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you on you. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I try my best, but it's just never good enough. I'm reminded of how much I need to know. You are for me, you're not against me. You are with me. I'm not alone through all the darkest times and brightest days. I know. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, We are moving from Revelation chapter 19 into today, chapters 20 and 21, two chapters in the book of Revelation, two very significant chapters. And before we jump into our discussion and our study, I would like to just take a moment to thank Sherry for this beautiful picture on the Oregon coast. Uh, you're coming into this berm with just covered with those beautiful little white flowers and you can see the morning fog hasn't quite lifted yet and um, see the waves coming in just another lovely day on the ocean so I want to say Sherry thank you so much for what you bring us now let's jump right in the title of this series is called Revelation Now we say God shares his thoughts with you because God is taking and putting into the mind of John how God sees things from God's perspective, which makes this an extraordinarily rare book. So in chapter 20, we will call this the last things, because if you notice the graphic here, the object in the mirror is closer than it appears, and that would be the soon coming of Christ. So I hope you enjoy the words we're going to look at here. So in chapter 19, after the wedding reception of Christ and his church and the grand celebration that we were told about, we can now turn our attention to the final things. That is the removal of evil from the universe. Now, please, you need to keep in mind that God's purpose and God's plan is to eradicate evil from the universe. This is the setting for the final three chapters of the book of Revelation. You will see how important this is as we finish up with these three books. So in um, verse 1 of Revelation 20, it says, or reads, Then I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. That's a really long time. Just remember how Peter put it. He said a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So for us that seems forever. But in the world of the divine, that's not as long as you and I often think that it is. In verse 3 it reads, And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But then after these things, he must be released for a while. Now, let's pause here for just a moment. If he's going to be bound for a thousand years, then what is going on during this time? Some people would say, well, it's going to be a thousand years of paradise without evil on the earth. No. That is not what this is saying. What it's saying is that as the bride of Christ has welcomed his bride, the church, that something is going to be taking place in the heavenly realm. And when it is over, then Satan will be released. Now, let's look at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God, 
who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. So while Satan is bound, we see thrones, we see those who sit on them, the judgment is committed to them. And then we're seeing the resurrection of all of those who had given their lives to stand by faith alone for Jesus Christ. And it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So here's the picture. Satan is bound in this abyss, in this bottomless pit. He cannot escape. All he is left with is to view the earth after the church has ascended and people are just simply gone. They were struck at the coming of Christ. There's no living humans on the earth during this time while this judgment is taking place in the heavenly realm. So, point being here, Satan has a thousand years to contemplate the consequences of his rebellion and of his evil, of hatred, envy, jealousy, murder, every vile thing that ever happened on this earth. Satan can now just contemplate the consequences of his evil. It's extraordinary to see what John is seeing. He saw the church merge with civil power and become a persecutor. He is now seeing the final outcome of all of Satan's plans. And God is revealing them to you and I today. Verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So did you catch that? There's no living beings on the earth during this time. Satan is just simply contemplating the corruption he has brought to the universe. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, this phrase is going to occur several times, this thing called the second death. Now, we're talking about those who are seated on the thrones, those who are in the heavenly realm. The second death has no power. They're going to be servants in the household of God and reign with him during this thousand years. Now, this thing called the second death is really important to us because it, the second death is the final judgment of the wicked a death one cannot return from. It is the full and final cleansing and eradication of evil. So the death that we die naturally because we live in a world of sin is not the second death. That's the first. There is this thing called a second death. And I'm going to tell you there is no resurrection from the second death. And those who are seated with Christ, that death has no power over them. They have gained victory. Christ has defeated this death when he rose from the tomb because Jesus himself experienced that death of sin, which is called the second death. Verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, that's the evil city and the prince of that city to gather them together to battle whose number is of the sands of the sea. So when the thousand years are over, Satan's released from his prison. There will be a resurrection of everyone who remained on the earth that was struck dead at the coming of Christ. And they're going to gather together to a battle and they are like the sands of the sea. Now listen carefully. All the wicked are present as the holy city of sins. You'll read that in just a moment. But I want you to pay attention that the wicked are awakened with the same murderous mindset they died with, demonstrating they've had no change of heart. They have had no change in their thinking. They are fixed and unchangeable hearts. And those folks would have no peace and no joy in the heavenly realm. They have made their decision. 
It says in verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now that word devour means to be permanently destroyed. Follow that? Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. They are permanently destroyed. They are not an eternal lake of fire. They are permanently destroyed. You see, the words from the cultural context of John's time, that term forever and ever means until obliterated, never able to return. Forever and ever means you are gone until you are permanently gone and there is no return. If immoral, immortality is applied to the wicked, then sin and rebellion is still present in our universe and God has not removed evil from the universe. This message in Revelation 20 and 21 is about the permanent eradication of evil. It is gone forever, never to return again in the entire universe. Starting again with verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are. And it says they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Forever and ever is a Hebrew idiom that means until they are completely obliterated. It is the permanent eradication of the devil and his false prophet, not an immortal life in the fire. Forever and ever has been taken as a Greek pagan concept from Plato and made its way, immigrated into Christian religion as immortality of the wicked. But it says they are uh, completely eradicated. They are gone, never to come back. And that's good news for the redeemed. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and whom who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place for them. We call this the executive judgment, the great white throne. In verse 12 it reads, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Again, we call this the executive judgment. In verse 13, it says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This means that there is no literal eternal, eternal burning hell. There is only the second death never able to return. Where do people get the idea that death means forever in hell? which simply doesn't exist in Scripture. There is no resurrection from the second death because it's death, which is permanent. Let's go to chapter 21, the new things. Revelation 21, verse 1 reads, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also, there was no more sea. So understand this, that God's plan is he is going to make everything new as it was in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve first walked on the face of the earth. A brand new earth, a brand new heaven, and the old one is now completely gone, just as the rebellion is completely gone, and as evil has been completely eradicated. In verse 2 it reads, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Can, can you just let your mind wrap around this beautiful story of living in eternity with God who created the entire universe, who brought us into existence? My favorite verse in the entire book of Revelation is in 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now listen carefully. If the dead are still in an eternal lake of fire forever and ever, then there still would be pain. And the former things would still be there. But let me read you the text. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Sin and evil and the cause of it have been removed from the universe. That's what the book says. I'm not trying to make something up new. This is exactly what the book says. Notice verse 5. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are faithful and true. Now I'm going to challenge you. Do you believe the word of God or do you believe traditions carried on from Greek mythology making its way into the Christian church? The word seems to be profoundly clear here. It isn't even up for debate or discussion. Evil is eradicated and the cause of it is gone. Verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son and my daughter. That son is inclusive of all genders. You see, this is the gospel coming full circle. Jesus is always about full restoration, healing, and life. Notice how John wrote this in uh, chapter 10, verse 10 of his letter he wrote to his church. I have come, Jesus said, that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. And here is the promise in Revelation 21, verse 6. Isn't that just absolutely amazing? In verse 8, all things evil permanently removed. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And the text, the word of God says, which is the second death. Which is the second death. The lake of fire instantly eradicates anything or anyone who goes into that lake, never to return again. They're gone forever and ever. Once again, John sees evil persons eradicated, not tortured eternally. Death is a death, not immortal life. Not immortal death where you die over and over again. Death is completely defeated and gone forever as is the evil and the wicked. And here's the evidence, right there in front of us, on the screen. It is gone, friends. That means the universe is safe. It's safe to be in the presence of God. There is no longer any fear to rule over humanity. Verse 9, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Oh man, wouldn't it be great if we could just see what John saw? 
Isn't that just a beautiful thing to see? Verse 12, And she had a great high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the twelve gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. You can come from all directions to the city. It does not matter where you live. From any direction you come, there are three gates to welcome you. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, its breadth, and height are equal. Now, I want you to pause for just a moment. If you go back and look at the Old Testament, the most holy compartment, it was a cube. It was equal distance in width, length, and height. So it's like this city is like the dwelling place of God. It's like the cube of God dwelling with the children of Israel. Now, if this city was 12,000 furlongs, that's approximately 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles high. That's a city that'll hold uh, millions upon millions upon millions. Did you know that? So 12 gates, 12 foundations, described as a cube. 12 is the number for God's people, the 12 tribes of Israel, the number for his church, the 12 disciples. The cube is the shape of the most holy compartment of the sanctuary or God's dwelling place in the Old Testament. And this describes God with us in person, face to face. And it says that he would wipe away our tears. I want you to pause for just a moment. If, if God is going to wipe away your tears, does that mean that he reaches out of each of the redeemed and when he touches your cheek to wipe away those tears, you are fully and completely healed and restored? Verse 17, then he measured its wall, 140 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is of an angel or a messenger, Verse 18, the construction of its wall was jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. Transparent gold? Did you know there is a thing called transparent gold? That's where the gold, they gave the astronauts special visors on their helmets for going to the moon, and it had a single molecular layer of gold, which meant that those visors were completely transparent. Did you know that? Verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardex, sardinex, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopras, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Those precious stones are like the stones on the breastplate the high priest wore in the Old Testament. That's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Just imagine what John is seeing right now. We, need, we just need to like bring this into full color. It would just make an incredibly powerful and visual story. In verse 21, it reads, the 12 gates were 12 pearls and each individual gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So you know how a pearl is made. A clam is in the ocean and it opens up and draws water in and filters out and gets its food. And occasionally a piece of sand that's sharp and irritating will get into the pearl. And then that pearl, in order to endure and stop the pain, begins to coat that sand with the stuff we call pearl. And that pain no longer is an irritation to that little clam. So when you look at a pearl necklace, you're looking at the 
way this little clam stops its severe pain. Now, what does it mean when you have an entire gate made of a pearl? It has a beautiful meaning to it. It's like God has fully covered our pain. And each time we enter a gate into the New Jerusalem, we will know because of that pearl gate that God has taken the pain of the entire human race. How do you feel about that? What does that tell you about the nature and the character of God? That he wants us to be involved in judgment. He wants us to be involved in eternity with him. And he has created this lovely place, a new earth, a new heaven. Everything old has passed away. All that ugly stuff is gone. Verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. That's powerful, isn't it? And the gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That city is always accessible, just like God is accessible to you today. And the city will always be a safe place for us to live in. The church is supposed to be a safe place. I just want to express to you that the church should always be safe. But I want you to go back and look at this text carefully and understand that God, in his great wisdom, in his judgment, has chosen to eradicate all evil and all pain completely from the universe, including your personal pain. That is how much God loves the human race that he created in his own image. And he is there for you. I'd like to go to our closing picture. That is uh, one of those pictures from Death Valley. What an interesting picture to conclude this conversation with. But look at all the marble and the veins. This is what's left over from the turbulence of the flood, a judgment of God that chose to eradicate everything that was preexistent, that was evil in Noah's day. But that's all going to be made new for you and for me. Isn't that good news? Blessings. Study this. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.